Hello there. Um, I entitled this talk uh, Survive, Drive, Win, which is uh, the title of a book I just, uh, I've just uh, written with uh, a guy from the Times newspaper. Um, lessons from Formula One, how to win. Um, what I'm going to talk you through a little bit is, uh, firstly, a little bit about Formula One. I don't know how much um, each of you know about it, but I think that's kind of useful background. So I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about how a Formula One team works and uh, the amounts of money involved. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the team that I used to run, which went through a whole bunch of different iterations. It started owned by a tobacco company and then by Honda Motor Company and then myself and uh, another guy called Ross Braun ended up uh, owning the team and then we sold it to Mercedes. Um, it's recently become the most successful team in Formula One history. So the story really is of a team that was, I have to say, pretty mediocre at one stage, if not worse than that, and how it got to um, you know, really incredible success. Um, and, and I think the, the really interesting part, which um, uh, hopefully there's some takeaways for each of you, is what did we learn out of that? And in fact, I, I, I did see that Google had done um, a survey recently, I think, of lots of businesses about you know, what made them successful. And I've been sort of pitching this story probably for about the last decade, but I think that uh, if you've seen the work that you've done and what I'm going to talk about, there is a huge amount of crossover, which uh, when I actually read that, I was kind of gratified that I've been um, peddling some of the right messages. So, uh, um, so backgrounds. Um, this is a slide that my mother insists I, uh, I make. She's one of the people uh, in, uh, in the world who hates sports. So whatever I achieved in sports, um, she, you know, completely, um, you know, discards. So, you know, she says, tell him you had a proper job once. So <laughs> this is for mum. Uh, mum, I did have a proper job once. Uh, so I work, work for um, Ford Motor Company for about 25 years um, in a lot of different activities. I, you know, I was in sales, I was in marketing, I run a big manufacturing plant. I was, um, for my sins, uh, director of customer service. I. Uh, um, ran Aston Martin for uh, for a few years, so lots and lots of um, of different things, and then had my midlife crisis uh, at about 40 years old, and decided that uh, I wanted to do something different, and went to run a um, uh, what what might be called an outsourced engineering company, a much smaller company that provided engineering services to uh, to the car industry, um, which was involved in off-road rallying. Did a lot of work for the. Um, the Subaru Rally team. For reasons I, uh, I, I is too lengthy to go into, uh, we ended up uh, managing a not very successful Formula One team uh, in around uh, late 2001, early 2002. Um, and then I was in Formula One um, for about the next uh, 12 or 13 years um, with the same team, but through various iterations and, uh, and various ownerships. So, uh, um, and now, just to, to sort of finish off, I invest in lots of small uh, companies, some of which uh, you may be familiar with. I'm uh, chairman of a, an esports team called Fnatic, um, which is probably the biggest um, European team of uh, about a, a dozen um, uh, teams of, uh, of games players who have done incredibly well around the world in games like League of Legends and, uh, and, and the like. So uh, I, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with that. So, <laughs> what happens when uh, this, this young lad with this blue chip corporate background goes to, uh, goes to a, a, a sport like Formula One? Well, for those of you who are not familiar, this is the, um, I don't know how to, how to say this, the archangel maybe, um, but the person who really put Formula One on the map. I mean, Formula One, prior to the advent of Bernie Ecclestone, was something that a bunch of mainly uh, English, um, sort of eccentrics almost, uh, got involved with very, very amateur, and uh, Bernie is the man who, uh, who really took it from very little into one of the biggest sports in the world. And even today, although it's, uh, it's had um, a few more difficulties and leveled out due to competition with other sports, Formula One is invariably up there in the top three nationally. So you know, if you go to the Nordic countries, you might get skiing at the top or tennis in others, but Formula One is, is invariably there. So this is the man that did it. I, um, 
Uh, I put the title actually of another book which was written in the 1970s called Welcome to the Piranha Club because for someone who, who works for a big company and I'm, I'm the biggest admirer of what big corporations can do but when you go into something like this you learn a completely different set of skills. Um, you know, for, at Ford I was probably at the entrepreneurial end of the, uh, the spectrum in terms of the management there at that time you go to something like Formula One and you find you're a beginner at that. You know, these people take huge decisions, um, usually involving their own money, and you learn a lot from working with, uh, with people like Bernie. And of course, you know, there's another side, you know, um, he's had various difficulties, uh, if you like, with the authorities over the years, but it almost comes with the territory that, uh, you know, people who are making those sort of decisions and uh, working very quickly, uh, you know, sometimes uh, trip over from time to time, but, if, I think if you can have the balance of both sets of skills to some extent or another, then uh, sort of it's, um, it equips you for uh, uh, a great career. Um, so just a little bit about uh, what does a Formula One team look like? Well, I, I'm, I'm talking here about uh, the big teams and really uh, part of the problem that Formula One has got is that there are three teams which have completely dominated uh, for the last five or so years. So that's Mercedes principally, that's Ferrari and um, uh, the team owned by Red Bull, or the two teams owned by Red Bull. But um, you know, these teams are big businesses. Um, the operating budget would be you know, about $500 million uh, per annum. And that's your, that's your annual operating budget. Before you get that far, you've got to invest in significant facilities. So you know, at Mercedes uh, and some of the other big teams, you'll find you know, state-of-the-art aerodynamic wind tunnels, which probably cost about 50 million um, of any currency, sterling or, or dollars, to, uh, to build in the first place two or three year program. So, you know, before you get to the state where you can actually spend that much money, uh, why is it so expensive? Well, it's so expensive because you need a lot of people. You need a lot of people because to be competitive, you have to design a new car every year. <coughs> Formula One is really the only motorsport where although you're allowed to buy certain systems, like you know, for example the brake system, which are pretty much uh, standard across the cars, um, you, know, you have to have the intellectual property to your car. You can't go and buy one off the shelf. And almost every other motorsport formula around the world, you do have the ability to buy either the complete thing and then go racing, or um, uh, at least the major parts of it. So maybe a couple of thousand people, maybe someone like Mercedes up to uh, 1,200 people on the chassis and maybe another 800 people or so on the engine side. And they're very early technology adopters. I mean, you've got to keep improving. So they're, uh, they're, 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 they're companies that in all areas, whether it be the software, whether it be energy recovery systems, whether it be the body structures, you know, they are absolutely, um, you know, top of their game. And, you know, and I would argue in lots of areas, you know, possibly 20 or 25 years ahead of, you know, things like, um, you know, aerospace, certainly in the, in the use of uh, things like composite materials. So, as I said, very um, rapid development. A Formula One car has got about the same number of parts of, uh, as, as a road car. So maybe, uh, you know, 4,000 uh, uh, designed parts. Um, and you've got to design those every year in a very short window. So you might start in, you know, say July with the gearbox, which is very complicated and it also sets up the aerodynamics at the back of the car. So that's one of the first things maybe you think about. And you've got to have the thing uh, on wheels ready to go in, uh, in, in uh, January, February time, ready to go testing. And then you start racing in March and you race through to uh, beginning of November, by which time you start it again. So you've got to design a huge number of parts, and that's a cycle that a Formula One team might do in six months, whereas a regular car company um, you know, might take three to five years to do the same job. Now you might think, well, you know, they're only making three or, five, three or four cars a year, so they can do that, but it is done in exactly the same way. So if you went to Mercedes or McLaren or a lot of the, the bigger top Formula One teams, you know, they'd be using Katia, the IBM Dassault, um, uh, software which you know, you'd find any big engineering business the Mercedes teams runs completely on SAP which you, know, you might associate with a very large company that's making a lot of products but you know it controls the um, the material flow system and you know a lot of the big teams use just regular facilities and that goes through the whole piece you know I know some of you here may be uh, 
lawyers or finance or from other functions, I guarantee you that if you went into one of the bigger Formula One teams behind the scenes, you would recognise exactly what goes on. I mean, the end result, you know, might be very glamorous, and you know, you go to Monaco and all the nice things that you go go to, but underneath that, it's fundamentally a very well-run, you know, very strong uh, engineering business, and you need a significant amount of performance improvement every year, you know. If you don't get sort of 12 or 15 percent performance improvement, you know, taking aside from any change in the rules, you will go backwards. So it is absolutely inevitable, uh, you know, absolutely just just continuous pressure. And if you look at things like aerodynamics, you say, well, how can you continue to evolve the aerodynamics of a car? But even with, you know, no regulation change, so everything exactly the same in terms of the rules you've got to meet. If you look at a graph of aerodynamic improvements, um, literally it's a, you know, uh, it, the relationship of the hour spent in the wind tunnel to the amount of improvement is almost linear. So you know, the, the inventiveness of the, uh, the, of the engineers is, is almost continuous and you've just got to keep going and that's not just between seasons, but you have to keep improving the car uh, during the season as well. So I thought I'd tell you a tiny bit about you know, the, the, the team that I was involved with, which is, uh, is now Mercedes. Um, before Mercedes and before Ross and I owned the team, we were, uh, we were owned by the Honda Motor Company, great engineering company, and we were uh, extremely well prepared, we thought, for the, uh, the 2009 season. Um, I just um, managed to uh, get uh, this guy, Ross Braun, uh, involved. I mean, in Formula One, really over the last couple of decades, there have, have been two people on the engineering side who have been, you know, the, 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 the most successful people. Uh, a guy called Adrian Newey, who has worked for the Red Bull team for a long, long time, and, uh, and Ross, who worked with uh, Michael Schumacher at Ferrari for a long period of time. Incredibly agile and successful uh, automotive engineers and, and good engineering managers, as well as being as great engineers. And, you know, 2008, when, uh, when Ross started with us, we thought, you know, 2009, you know, maybe we could come in the, uh, the top three of the championship. I mean, that was our aspiration. Um, uh, as, uh, as, as, as is usual, um, I think Napoleon may have originally said this, or he probably didn't say it at like, like I've got here, actually. He probably said it in French and, you know, in a different, more elegant way. But uh, the, uh, the literal translation is, uh, Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And the financial crisis came along. Uh, we were very well prepared. And uh, uh, Honda decided to pull out. And, and I think with good reason in many ways. I mean, uh, as you'll remember, when uh, Lehman Brothers went down, um, you know, the world went to a hell, of a hell in a handbasket. Uh, you know, car dealers stopped refusing. They refused to take cars. Um, the, uh, the Swindon plant, which was the main uh, UK facility of, uh, of, of Honda was originally intended to be shut down for uh, a few weeks. I think in the end it was shut down for about six months. And Honda decided, you know, they needed to um, stick to their knitting and worry about their main business, and they decided, Christmas of 2008, to um, uh, to pull out. Um, and we looked for someone to uh, to buy the team. Now, as you can imagine, and as you will um, read in the book, if, uh, if if you care to do so. Uh, the only people who wanted to buy a Formula One team at the end of 2008 were certainly people you would not wish to deal with. Um, I can guarantee that. And uh, the, the, the book talks about, uh, rather amusingly, some of the people that uh, uh, we briefly got involved with. And uh, you know, I think Honda were very gracious and very honorable because what they didn't want was to hand the team to someone who they didn't know and uh, the thing would... Um, you know, reflect very badly on them if it, uh, if, if it went poorly. Um, and they decided probably that the, uh, the, the, the best of a bunch of worst alternatives was to, uh, to give the team to, uh, to Ross and myself. Um, the good news was that um, we paid a pound for it. Uh, the, the bad news was that uh, we, we took on all the liabilities. So we had uh, 719, to be exact, employees. We had a uh, uh, a salary bill of about uh, two million uh, a month. Um, at this point, I have to say, Mrs. Fry and Mrs. Braun had a sense of humour failure. Um, 
they were, they were um, very uh, correct in uh, observing <laughs> that this probably wasn't going to work out very well uh, and that possibly we would end up uh, sleeping in a, a tent or a caravan for the rest of our lives. Um, because uh, you know this is not a place for the uh, the faint-hearted. We, we took on uh, all the liabilities and uh, off we went. Um, maybe you'll ask afterwards why on earth we did that and I probably still can't explain it but uh, um, off we went and we, we had the first challenge in that Honda said you know if we're out we're out so you know we had a car designed for a Honda engine um, you know, Formula One engine cars are bespoke. So, you know, if, if you took your, um, you know, your Ford outside uh, or in your uh, your garage at home, or uh, and tried to put a BMW engine in it, it probably wouldn't fit very well because they're designed you know, to kind of to go together. We had the same problem, but exacerbated, you know, probably you know, several hundred percent in that these things are, you know, very very uh, specific. So. Uh, very nicely, um, Ferrari and Mercedes-Benz offered uh, to sell us an engine. So one of my first tasks as CEO was to write a cheque for uh, 8 million euros because they rightly said, um, you know, you've got two private individuals. Um, you know, we don't know if you're going to be around, so you'll have to pay for the season up front. So that was kind of a, a moment of truth. So we, uh, we paid our engine bill and we tried to get a Mercedes engine into a car designed for a Honda, which was a bit tricky. Now, this is not gonna sound very much, probably, but we ended up with a, a powertrain, an engine gearbox, uh, which was about half an inch higher than uh, that it should have been, which in, a, in Formula One terms, center of gravity and all that was, you know, we were not expecting to do very well. Um, we thought instead of third, maybe if we could be midfield, and the chance of us, you know, not going bust by the end of the year was pretty high. So we bunged our, uh, our lovely Mercedes engine into uh, our Honda car and hey presto, we were fastest, which was <coughs> remarkable. Um, why were we fastest? Uh, for two reasons principally. I mean, we'd done a lot of things right, but the reason we were fastest was uh, for two principal reasons. One is that the Mercedes engine was and you know, is now probably the best. I think just maybe now Ferrari may be uh, slightly ahead, but that's probably the first time in the last decade where the Mercedes engine has not been the, the engine to have. So the Honda engine wasn't great. Um, that's improved a hell of a lot uh, in recent years as well. But at that time, we went from a relatively poor Formula One engine to the best Formula One engine. We'd also discovered something, um, an innovation with the aerodynamics at the back of the car, I'll, I'll talk about it briefly, uh, briefly later, but uh, something called a double diffuser, um, which two other teams actually al also thought of, but our execution was, uh, was a hell of a lot better. So we were, we were fastest in testing. Now in those days, you didn't have to test a car which was in accordance with the rules. And for those of you who you know, are on engineering bias or remember your, your, uh, your physics or maths from school, the easiest way to make something go fast is just take a lot of weight out of it. So with a Formula One car, because they're so light in the first place, in those days, about 600 kilos, uh, if you can take a bit of weight out, and everyone assumed that we were testing the car under weight, and we were kind of showboating, because as you'll observe from the pictures, we didn't have anything in the way of sponsorship, so a good way of attracting sponsors is to, uh, to, uh, to go very quickly, and everyone thinks, you yeah, know, that's great. So. Everyone assumed that we were, uh, we were showboating, as it were. In fact, we were doing the opposite. We were weighing the thing down as much as we could to go as slow as we could, and we were still more than a second faster than anyone else. I mean, it was, in Formula One terms, a second is, you know, you die for a second. I mean, it's a, you know, a couple of tenths would be a brilliant advantage. You know, you can do the maths. Uh, a, a race is uh, it's a 90 second lap. You know, a race might be uh, 60 or 70, uh, uh, laps. If you're a second, of fast, uh, a second of lap faster than anyone else, then uh, you know at the end of the race, assuming you keep going, you're going to be uh, a country mile in the lead. So we had a huge, huge advantage. Um, we had, we started to attract a little bit of sponsorship. Richard Branson, who uh, who knows a good thing when he uh, he sees it, <laughs> and realised that we were uh, you know going to be pretty good at this. And they've been trying to people have been trying to get Virgin into Formula One for about ten years unsuccessfully. Uh, Richard came along, and this is a, a shot from the uh, 
the Melbourne Grand Prix, which was the first Grand Prix where we announced Virgin sponsorship. Certainly at that time, probably even now, uh, Richard attracted more publicity, so you know, he paid actually a relatively small amount of money for the uh, sponsorship in the scheme of things, but uh, the amount of global coverage he gave us was a, uh, was a huge benefit to us. So uh, we started to uh, raise a bit of money and, hey presto, Melbourne, uh, we were first and second, and then we went to the next race and we won that one, and then went to the third race uh, in Bahrain, we won that one. By this stage, uh, Good old Richard had become a permanent fixture. You know, he was uh, he was uh, he was around more than the mechanics. I mean, uh, you know, in his mind we were the Virgin team. Which, uh, um, but it, it, it was great. We had a, a great time, and uh, we won that race. And uh, by the end of the season, as uh, Chris kindly said at the start, um, we won the world championship. Um, not only the drivers championship, but also the constructors, constructors championship. Um, we won eight races, we were first and second in four of them, and uh, it was all great, hurrah. <laughs> then it got serious. Um, Formula One is not a place for two private individuals, um, frankly, and lightning rarely strikes uh, twice in the same place. So uh, we took a, uh, a big investment from, uh, uh, from Mercedes-Benz, who bought the majority of the team, at this stage, things got kind of a bit more serious. The, uh, the shop there is uh, our two new drivers, uh, uh, Jensen Button and Rubens Barrichello, who had been very successful with us the previous year in 2009, 2010. Uh, for various reasons, we had a complete change in, uh, in driver lineup with the great Michael Schumacher came out of uh, retirement. Nico Rosberg, um, who subsequently also became uh, a world champion, uh, joined us. Um, the other people in the picture, the, the, the guy with the fancy moustache is Dieter Zetscher, who's the uh, long-time, very successful chief executive of Mercedes-Benz. So, you know, it suddenly got serious. We went from a Japanese team to uh, a privately owned sort of english e team to, um, uh, you know, owned by Mercedes-Benz at that time, I think 12th best known brand in the world. So, uh, you know, things changed pretty quickly, which gave us a lot of challenges with uh, you know, internally with the uh, the culture of the team, but it was a, a really you know, a great start to uh, to a new relationship, and uh, uh, it took us a bit of time to get our act together. I mean, sadly, to stay alive in 2009, we had to let go a, a huge number of the staff. So we we, we let go uh, you know several hundred people, which meant that whilst we could do very well in 2009, we had no investment in the future whatsoever so um, it got a bit tough for a uh, a few years and sadly you know we never won with uh, with michael uh, which was uh, i'd say a huge disappointment but the team have been uh, uh, champions uh, not only constructors but also uh, uh, drivers champions with uh, uh, principally lewis hamilton uh, seven times in the last 10 years so yeah this is a massively successful team and on to the sort of the meat of this, where hopefully you know you'll get um, uh, some value, is you know what it takes. So how how does this team continue to uh, to win um, uh, you know year after year? Um, I'd say the first thing is they've got the best people, um, and you know and I think I could probably stop talking to you here and just talk about this one subject for the um, uh, for the next hour, um, but unless you have the Lewis Hamiltons or the Valentino Rosses if you're in motorcycle racing, unless you have the best chief engineer, the best body engineers, the best um, right through the organization, um, attracting and retaining the best people and actually getting them to work together and do the best job is by far and away um, the, um, the most important thing. You know, why does uh, Lewis Hamilton earn the, uh, the mega big bucks? Um, and the reason is that he can take a car which possibly isn't quite a winning car and through sheer skill and determination and great teamwork and all the other attributes that he brings to bear, he'll get it to uh, a winning level. And the, the, the drivers are not just there to drive the car. I mean, they are really the team leaders. Now, why was Michael Schumacher, um, you know, 
many times, seven times world champion, I would argue is because he was the, uh, the best team player. He, he motivated the whole team um, by you know, demonstrating you know, incredible hard work and incredible dedication, and that just rubs off on the, uh, the whole organization. And someone like um, Lewis does the same thing. I mean, when you watch a, a Grand Prix, if you watch Grand Prix, you know, you're on the slowing down lap, if he's won, you know, inver invariably Lewis will come on the radio and say, you know, thanks to everyone involved, thanks to the people back, back at Brackley in the factory. And that's not a, a PR stunt. I mean, he realizes that, you know, the person who is working away diligently in the gearbox shop is just as you know, important to his success as he is behind the wheel and actually motivating all those people and, uh, and thanking them and uh, you know, being that great team player is the, uh, the most important thing. So you know, number one, will you ever have you know, the 11 best players in a football team altogether? Probably not, but you can aspire to, have you got the best goalkeeper? Have you got the best centre forward, et cetera, et cetera, and do your best to, uh, uh, to get that sort of team of people. I would say number two to me is um, along same same theme of uh, best people is uh, diversity being such a huge advantage. Uh, this shot, which is uh, a, a couple of years old now, uh, these young people here are the uh, some of the best and brightest young engineers from uh, Petronas, which is the uh, Malaysian state oil company. It's uh, the biggest sponsor of the uh, the Mercedes team, and what. Petronas have done for many years is send to the Formula One team some of their brightest, uh, youngest uh, petrochemical um, engineers who are expected to provide performance to the team. Um, you know, as the oil and lubricant supplier, they would be expected to probably provide five performance upgrades a year. So lower friction, you know, better performance of the fuels and oils. And you know, most of the audiences, uh, sadly, that I speak to are principally, you know white middle-aged male um, and uh, I point out to them that that's not the world anymore. Um, as you'll observe, you can see for yourself that uh, you know, this is a, a much uh, uh, a broader um, uh, base and in my experience having people with different backgrounds successfully working together is hugely powerful. If you go to Mercedes you'll find a design office full of people from all around the world and I can see from your audience uh, here that uh, Google would subscribe to the, uh, the same idea. You just need the best people where, wherever they're from, and uh, you know, they're from uh, every corner of the world. Um, if you've got the best people, you need to give them the best tools. There is no point in hiring the best surgeon in the world and then giving them a knife and fork and say, please do great operations. And you know, the thing that especially Honda bought to the uh, uh, the now Mercedes team was just a huge investment in facilities. This shot is from uh, uh, the, the inside of wind tunnel. Um, wind tunnels run at you know real speed, so this uh, blasts air over the car um, at uh, 180 plus uh, plus miles an hour. Um, certainly, at that time, structurally, it was the best wind tunnel in Formula One, and I know it's been kept up to date with the best analytical software. Um, so, you know, investing in the right tools. So, you know, I've been to lots of companies over the years who say, you know, our, our people are cleverer than anyone else's. Um, so, you know, they can come up with smarter ideas. So, we don't need to invest. Um, I think you've got to do both. You've got to invest very heavily in the right tools, and you've got to have the best people because the best people deserve the uh, the best tools. May seem obvious. Clear objectives and accountability. Um, you know, very, very focused on. What are you uh, trying to achieve? You know, sometimes in my corporate career, I would, I would sit there and you know, even for a big company like Ford in those days, sometimes we would have you know, 20 or 30 corporate objectives. And even you know, with large numbers of people, more than Google has got, um, at that time we would struggle with lots and lots of different initiatives. And I think keeping it very focused with, uh, and making clear to every single person what they're responsible for, uh, for delivering. I guarantee you, that if, uh, you know, your, if you have a son or daughter who went for an internship at Mercedes you know, just for a summer holiday job, they would get a, a proper job and they would be re required to deliver you know, whatever they were uh, being employed to deliver. It would not be you know, learn a little bit about this generally or shadow someone. It would be you are responsible. This is what you've, uh, you've got to deliver. Um, 
And then I think the job of management, and I, again, I saw this on the Google survey, where I think it said that sort of management not interfering too much and not getting into the detail was very important. So I picked uh, a slide here of the late um, Nicky Lauda, who was uh, chairman of the Mercedes team, great Formula One world champion, but uh, a great person to have as a chairman. You know, great at making very, very crunchy decisions. You know, when I pitched to, 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 to Nicky when he arrived as my chairman that we'd been trying to get Lewis uh, on board, you know, his, uh, his response was, go hire him and we are, we'll ask for forgiveness later. I mean, and it's, it's always difficult when you're hiring someone who's probably going to be paid more than the chairman of the company that owns, um, you know, Mercedes in this particular case. But, uh, you know, he was just, you know, very black and white and, you know, being supportive and being around. You know, I'm a great um, supporter of uh, so-called management by walking around. If you're open and you're accessible, you know, if you've hired the best people and you've given them the best tools to do the job, then why look over their shoulder or keep asking them, you know, what they're up to or, you know, where they are on a project or what have you, but be around to answer questions, be around to uh, make decisions where required. So I think to me, um, you know, managing a team of very talented uh, individuals is a, uh, a very particular exercise where uh, all you're going to do is piss people off if you start, uh, you know, diving into the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the detail. Uh, great teamwork goes without saying. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about engaging every single individual and with a big team of, uh, you know, hundreds of people, just make, making clear um, to people what they're supposed to achieve and making them, uh, each of them feel part of it. Um, to break this up uh, uh, just briefly, I guess the, um, the epitome of great teamwork is the, um, uh, the pit stop that uh, Formula One teams do. Um, they will, they're capable of changing all four wheels and tyres you know, in you know, certainly less than three seconds, closer to two seconds. But the, the, the secret of this is doing it in a repeatable fashion. Um, you know, doing it once very, very quickly in two seconds is great, but if you screw up the next time and lose 12 seconds, it's kind of not such a great outcome. I can tell you, having a, uh, a Formula One car coming down a pit lane at you at 100 kilometers an hour, when the guy's been on the track doing 180 miles an hour and he's got eyes as big as this, is a scary experience. So, uh, um, now if you can ask people to do that, I mean, I'm using the pit stop just as a, uh, an example, but if you're gonna ask people to push to the uh, the limit all the time when they're engineering, when they're driving, um, you've got to e expect things to go wrong. And I think things that Formula One teams are really good at is developing an environment of what I would call no blame. Um, you know, I think you've all had this experience that you're trying as hard as you can, something goes wrong, and then somehow you, you get criticized for, uh, um, for, for doing that. And I think you've got to accept, especially in a high performing environment, that. Uh, you know, mistakes, accidents happen. If you say to a Formula One driver, don't crash, that's really easy. I mean, they're gonna break, uh, you know, five meters earlier, they're gonna accelerate five meters later, you know, they're not gonna crash, but they're not gonna win anything either. So, you know, you don't want them to crash the whole time, clearly, um, but you have gotta expect that from time to time, you know, shit happens. Um, so, you know, be prepared for that. And I think that the things that top teams are very good at is, preparing for something to go wrong, um, putting in place an action plan for when it goes wrong, and actually you know, reacting appropriately with the individuals involved. And you, know, you make a mistake, you get fired, everyone in the room says, oh shit, I won't do that again because you know, I'm not gonna try very hard because he got fired, so I'm gonna get fired. So you know, it's very, very important to react in the appropriate way, and the appropriate way is actually to help the person as much as possible and the team as much as possible not to make the same mistake again. Now, if the same mistake keeps being made, clearly you have got to react. But, you know, obviously the first port of call is as much training and as much support and as much help um, as you can, uh, you can possibly get. Uh, communication, incredibly important um, in a uh, high performing environment. I mean, I guarantee that if you go to um, it's the, the Mexican Grand Prix this coming weekend. Um, even if Mercedes win it, um, I guarantee there will be a list of 20 or 30 things that went wrong. And what they will be doing 
you know, straight after the race, the drivers and the other uh, people at the circuit will be spending two, three plus hours after the race actually going through what went wrong, what went right. The following day, back at the factory in, uh, in the UK, there will be an all-hands meeting with everyone in the team. And when I say everyone, everyone is invited and there will be a very candid review of what went on, um, what went wrong, what went right, because you need that shortcut in terms of uh, communication in order to be able to react quickly enough. So in a Formula One environment, you'll race on the Sunday, you'll have the debrief on the Monday. You know, if there are problems, you'll probably have to have a solution in place by Thursday. Um, you'll have to make the parts over the following weekend and then they'll have to go to wherever they've got to go in the world, probably on the Monday or the Tuesday, in order to be ready to start again on the following Thursday. So, and I've never worked in the armed forces, but it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a team environment where you're either in the team or you're not in the team. So there are very, very few, if any, secrets within a team. You know, it is assumed that the confidentiality you know, is there and everyone is going to play the game and everyone is going to uh, you know, put the team first. So uh, uh, that open communication is, uh, and, and very quick communication, which shortcuts any bureaucracy, is very, very important. Focusing on what gives results, I mean, there are thousands of parts in a Formula One car. There are lots of things that you can do. You know, there's lots of interesting things you can do. You, know, you can work on all sorts of lovely engineering projects, but at the end of the day, there's three areas which drive performance, which is aerodynamics, performance of the engine, and uh, how you use the tires. All the cars have got the same tires, but how you actually use those tires to best advantage. And I think the message I want to take out of this slide is that uh, you know, don't get diverted by all the interesting things which are lovely to work on, but actually don't drive the performance of the team. And in Formula One, it's very easy to go off into the boonies uh, you know, worrying about uh, you know, front toe stiffness or various engineering esoteric uh, uh, things which do bring performance and you do need to worry about them a little bit but keeping, uh, keeping your eye on the ball. Um, innovation, um, good ideas come from uh, absolutely anywhere and if I come back to the start of my talk, um, the, the so-called double diffuser uh, which I spoke about um, you know, I, I was there when a very junior Japanese engineer, um, when we were talking about this, uh, this potential, uh, the aerodynamics of the following year's car, you know, put up his hand and said, well, you know, I've got this idea. Um, and, and instantly, most people thought he was talking about something which was not within the rules. And I, I still, to this day, believe that the reason he had the idea was that he was reading the the rules of the sport, um, literally, because he was uh, English, it was his second, um, second language, um, most of the rest of us were reading the rules as in we were overlaying it with the spirit of the rules. And this young guy um, you know, had this idea and within a few seconds everyone realised that it was, uh, it, it was gold dust and uh, you know, he'd observed something. Now I, I believe to this day that if we didn't have that environment where it was very open, that everyone felt confident to introduce ideas, possibly we would never have uh, got that idea and we wouldn't have uh, won the world championship. So I just think it's a good example of a good idea can come from anywhere. If you observe a great engineer like Ross Braun in a, uh, a team meeting um, with all his engineers, you know, it's very interesting he will say very little. You know, he will make sure that everyone has their say and invariably, the engineering has a right solution most of the time. Um, but if the, the meeting doesn't come to a conclusion, he will make a decision on the, the team's behalf, but he's not dictating to the team. He's actually trying to get all the, uh, the good ideas on the table. And as I say, this car, which won in 2009, which was really the start of this uh, uh, trail of success for uh, the team that is now Mercedes, really only had uh, one great idea, um, as I say, but it had excellent execution. The Williams team and the Toyota team also had the same idea, but uh, didn't make it work uh, anything like as well. Data acquisition, um, there are about 15,000 channels of, uh, of data uh, coming off a Formula One car. That is going up exponentially. I mean, uh, if you go back to uh, when I was a lad, you had uh, some, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Thank you for that laugh. <laughs> Most of you weren't alive when I was a lad. And, uh, 
But you know, you, literally, you had a, a, a stopwatch and you had a clipboard and you wrote down a lap time. I mean, that was about the only data you had. You didn't have corner times, and uh, you know, it's now evolving at an enormous rates. I mean, uh, uh, at the moment, you might have uh, 15, 20,000 channels of data. I think that'll get to uh, you know a million plus, um, you know, very shortly. Um, and the tools you need to analyze that um, are uh, are very important and. The agility of decision making, one of the things that the, that the Mercedes team especially, possibly a number of the others, have invested in very, very heavily are strategic tools which um, uh, guide during the race what you should do. Um, and, and in fact, the, uh, the chap who was instrumental in developing a lot of this um, actually came from, as, a, as a brilliant mathematician, uh, came from a graphic design. He, uh, he and his sister, uh, worked on the George Lucas uh, Star Wars early movies and he's someone I bumped into and, uh, uh, and he's still working uh, within Formula One but it's presenting the right information in the right way at the right moment. So what engineers will be looking at on the pit wall is very different data sets during the race depending on what's going on um, and they'll be fed huge amounts of pertinent information because if you've got to make a decision um, in a couple of seconds, then you know you can't be sitting there looking through dozens of spreadsheets. You've got to be presented with the right stuff at the right moment. And the decisions are so knife edge that you know you can look like an idiot or a hero very easily. And, and the person who's the the chief strategist in the case of Mercedes, for a clever young guy called James Vowles, you know sometimes he looks like an absolute hero, but unfortunately, occasionally. You know, he, he, he doesn't look uh, you know, too good, but the complexity of the decisions and the amount of information that they're trying to sift through to decide what to do means that uh, it's uh, something they get right most of the time. So in summary, uh, that's my wife, by the way. It's not uh, just, just, so, so, uh, just, so, just so, so mistaking, uh, mistaking the picture. You know. um, Celebration of success, I think, very important. I mean, uh, one of the things that Formula One teams, I know, I know that when times are hard, companies have a tendency to cut back stuff at the margins. I would say that Formula One teams are very good at uh, having a good party at the end of the season and during the season to sort of celebrate. what. And, and that's not just for the employees, that's for every family member who is associated with it, with the kids, because that's when everyone you know, comes together and actually uh, celebrates the, uh, the amount of effort they put into it. But the, there are no special processes in Formula One. I, I, you know, it works very quickly. It's the same design tools that you might find at Airbus or you know, another big company. It's just made to work very, very quickly. Um, finally, um, I have written a book about this. Um, you know, why should you buy it? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good read. Some of you are, uh, are holding it here. A um, guy called Ed Gorman, who, uh, who works for the Times, um, has done most of the, uh, uh, the, the, the actual writing, and he's a, he's a great writer, so it's quite racy. Uh, any money I receive uh, from the book will go to uh, uh, a couple of charities, a uh, charity called Hope for Tomorrow, which provides uh, mobile cancer uh, uh, units, uh, a dementia charity, and uh, another charity for, uh, called the Halo Project for kids with... Um, uh, with disabilities to get them uh, self-sustaining and uh, have their own uh, lives. So, you know, it's a great book for Christmas. So, uh, and, and it's it's not just about Formula One. Uh, a lot of it is about the business aspects. It's about working with Bernie Ecclestone. It's about working with Michael Schumacher. It's about the the business processes. So, uh, um, if uh, if Uncle Fred or Art, uh, Aunt Matilda needs a Christmas present, this is the place to go. <laughs> Buy yours now. Um, survive, drive, win. Uh, there it is. And uh, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>so I guess there's two questions um, that come to mind. The first is um, when you took on that liability, um, what was the upside you saw in terms of financial? I mean, if you're taking on a, a big cost base. Um, and the second question, I guess, is a similar theme, that when Mercedes take it on and they've got an operating cost of 500 mil, what's the upside financially for them? Um, I mean, I think the, the Mercedes arguments would be a lot more logical than our arguments. I mean, I, the, thing that's, the thing that you, you... The only thing really I miss from Formula One is the teamwork. And when you're, when you, when you're part of a team and you're in trouble, 
then you, know, you do your best to get out of that trouble. And you know, I don't think we were thinking this way at the time, but you know, we had 700 employees, we had 700 families. It was the middle of the recession, and we thought we'd give it a go. And the, in, in our view, what, what we actually did, we, we had a bit of money. Honda did give us a, a legacy, if you like. Um, and we worked out that if we went bust at the end of the following year, how much money would we need to pay off everybody to the same extent as we got, if, as if they'd been made redundant the year before. So we kind of ring fence the, um, uh, the payoff, if you like, and then the rest of the money we had became the budget. So I, I guess we just thought we'd give it a go. And, you know, we came up trumps. And we, and we never, ever had any um, reason to believe. We thought we'd done a good job, but we had no aspiration of winning the World Championship. I mean, uh, you know, I think it was far more likely that we were, you know, going to go bust at the end of the following year and uh, probably be very mid-range. And, uh, you know, I think, I think this, is, this is the Leicester City story, but it's probably even more incredible than Leicester City because the amounts of money and the amounts of technology why would any big company want to be involved in Formula One, Mercedes or otherwise, is because it's, it's one of the very few truly global um, sports. I mean, I know, I know that the, you know, the, the World Cups and the Olympics happen every, you know, every four years or whatever. But the beauty of Formula One is that, you know, it, it's visiting physically 20 places around the world. So if you're a if you're a sponsor or if you're a team owner, you can bring to life your your product and your investment around the world. You know, if you if you sponsor the Premiership, clearly most of the games are here in here in England. If you if you if you're a truly global company and you get involved in something like Formula One, then actually you know you actually can bring it to life on a global basis. For, specifically about Mercedes, um, they are among the best engineers in the world and. Arguably, Formula One is an incarnation of the highest engineering skill. So, if they're they're beating, you know, Ferrari, you know, you're saying to your customers, you know, we are the best. And you know, I have to say, having seen the the facilities at, at somewhere like Stuttgart, which is where Mercedes are based, you know, they they invest, as I've said here, incredibly heavily. And um, you know, so it's, it's it's a huge marketing benefit. There's also some small engineering spin-offs. You know, I would argue that. Uh, you know, a little bit about, uh, you know, hybrid and battery technology, et cetera. Uh, you know, it, it helps um, if, if you're doing something as, as high tech as Formula One. You kind of spoke to your kind of career progression over, over that time as well and how you've moved around lots of different roles. Um, how did you go about making those decisions to effectively change what you were doing so, so frequently? And how did you approach new roles and making sure that you kind of got up to speed quickly. Are there any kind of tips that you'd have on that? Um, I mean, I, I do have the talent, I have to say, for picking things up pretty quickly. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not a person who may be a detail expert, but I can pick up what you need to know. So I think having that sort of open mindset, I think, you know, listening to people, you know, helps because you pick up, you know, instead of transmitting how great you are, listening to other people and picking up as much as possible. So I think that's a a skill uh, w w which I do have. Uh, I've always believed, and I, I, I can't tell you why I've always believed this, but from a very early age, uh, you know, after uni, I believed that in order to do a good job, you needed to understand how it all went together. So I was always interested in the bigger picture and then working out, well, you know, my little bits, how could that contribute towards the, uh, the bigger, the, the bigger, the bigger picture? And I was just, I'm, I'm always fascinated by new things. So, you know, I will not stand here and claim I was any good at making cars. You know, I, I ran a manufacturing plant. You know, I would say I was pretty poor at it. Um, but I gave it a go and I learned one hell of a lot. And there were a lot of people around me. And because I worked in other functions, I could then sort of tie together, you know, how do I help the marketing guys by what we're doing in the manufacturing plant and vice versa. So I was always able to, you know, cross fertilize is probably the, the, the best way. Um, I mean, I didn't have any great strategic plan, I have to say. I mean, I, I'm just sort of an inquisitive type of person and, uh, you know, I'm always eager to, to learn more and you know, I, guess, I guess take a risk. I mean, logically, moving from Ford to a small engineering company wasn't <coughs> the best career move, but I guess 
you don't get to owning a Formula One team if you just do the thing that's safe and the thing that is predictable because everyone does the safe and predictable. So, you know, I try and encourage my kids, if everyone else is going right, then have a look at going left because, you know, left might be the right answer. Just because everyone's gone that way doesn't mean that, uh, so, I mean, I can't give you a blueprint for it, but I, maybe there's a few, uh, a few thoughts there. Thanks. Ma'am. Um, do you think that Formula One has become too complicated in terms of sort of data, technology, the inputs, or do you think that these companies have sort of a great benefit or a, a duty to get to grips with them and then looking at the wider application? So I'm thinking, for example, of Williams using wing technology to improve supermarket refrigerator cooling, um, applying those benefits to sort of wider society. Um, uh I think that there are spin-offs, and uh, you know, Williams is a very good example. Ironically, they're not very good at um, you know, Formula One at the moment. Um, but their, their engineering division um, is incredibly successful. So they are successfully. But the core reason for a Formula One team to exist is to win Formula One races. Um, do I think that this technology and the, the cost of the technology is a good investment? Um, for mankind, if you take it broadly, no, I don't. I think I think it's got completely out of hand, um, and the fact that three teams have won every race for the last five years is is boringly predictable. Um, and, and Formula One certainly has some significant structural problems. I mean, most of the money goes to the top teams. The teams below the top three get very little. Um, at the end of the day, a good big one is always going to beat a good little one. I mean, that's not to say a good, a, a, a big company, Toyota were in Formula One for a, a while, BMW were in Formula One, and they never really were very successful despite huge dollops of money. So it, it's difficult to say money is the, you know, the, the, the root of everything and is, is going to bring you success, but if you deploy that money well, you know, you are going to be successful. I mean, I think the Formula One has got to decide um, on a direction. Um, clearly cars are going, you know, electric. Formula E, which is the electric, uh, you know, motorsport is getting more and more successful. For my money, Formula One has got to be a lot more, uh, more entertaining. And certainly being involved in, um, uh, in eSports with, uh, with Fnatic, um, you know, you could see that it's, it's got to be perpetually entertaining. You know, an hour and a half's race, you know, where uh, something might happen at the start, something might happen in the middle, but then not much else. These days, for people's fast-moving lives, is not going to be successful. So I think they've got some personal. I think they've got some difficult decisions to make with distribution of income, and you know what actually is this sport? Because although there are spin-offs, you would never ever spend this much money to get the uh, the relatively small spin-offs that it uh, it provides. I'm trying to think about how to make the sport more accessible, and you mentioned esports. If you were to predict the role that esports will play in the future, where do you think it's going to take uh, take this sport? And you know, Google is about to launch a, a major gaming platform in less than a month as well, so I guess Google has an interest in it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's. Um, uh, I think it would be great. If actually, I think, I think you've got to do a couple of things in combination. I think that, uh, you know, Formula One races need to be made probably a lot shorter, um, a lot more, you know, punchy in terms of, you know, uh, short games, just like, uh, like in esports. But I guess it would be, you know, fantastic if actually you could race, you know, real time, you know, against the real drivers that were racing. And at the moment, um, you know, car race games are, you know, relatively speaking, I think there's about a million people worldwide who play, you know, um, you know a, a car race game or all the car race games. So it's, and, and, and the problem with the car race games at the moment is that it's a, it's a perfect replica of the real thing. And if the real thing's boring, a replica of it is invariably not going to be any different. So I, I, I think that, um, you know, you've got to, you've got to make, you know, the, the, the real thing much more entertaining and being able to race the real people real time. And I think the, the other thing which I think people make a mistake is, 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 is that replication of the real thing. The reason that esports are incredibly entertaining is that it's not the real world. 
I mean, if you play a game like League of Legends or Fortnite or whatever it happens to be, it's, it's fantasy. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, trying to make games a replica, whatever they might be, of the real thing is probably missing the point completely. Uh, and I think you, you know, you've got to keep your eye on uh, the, the entertainment side and how do you combine you know, entertainment and, uh, and, and make it you know, just really quick fire. I don't think people have got time to watch, you know, I think even a 90 minute football match with 245s is, uh, is hard going. So I think actually um, it, it making it uh, much more fun. Thank you very much.